Now, we are in, of course, Sevier County and Sevierville. How did his name get connected to this area? Well, he lived at Marble Springs. He lived at Marble Springs. Is and he did fight Dragon Canoe uh, at Boyd's Creek, which is here in Sevier County. Mm -hmm. And he did win the battle. He was not successful in killing Dragon Canoe, but he did win the battle at Boyd's Creek. And that stopped, temporarily at least, stopped Dragon Canoe's raids into the settlements. Well, I won't hold you any longer, but just let's name some of the things that John Sevier is remembered for. He was, of course, an Indian fighter. Yes. A husband. Had many, how many children total? Military leader, 18 children total. Military He's got leader. descendants in all 50 states in the United States. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, you said he was into politics some? Yes. He was the very first governor of the state of Tennessee. He served six intermittent terms as Tennessee's governor, mm -hmm. and he served in the state legislatures for North Carolina and Tennessee and the state legislatures, uh, both Tennessee and North Carolina, sent him to serve in the federal legislature uh, when the Capitol was in Philadelphia and again later after the Capitol moved to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Any other highlights of things that he can be remembered for? Or, uh... I think just uh, protecting civilization in the wilderness and mm -hmm. establishing and protecting civilization. Was he attracted to the wilderness? Did it give him a sense of adventure, you think? He was. Uh, in, after his formal education, his father taught him the vocations that his father did to make a, earn a living, and those became severe uh, 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 vocations as well. Mm -hmm. And out of all of them, his favorite was farming. But the reason that he preferred farming to other vocations was it allowed him more time for what he truly loved, and that was hunting. So what actually led him into the settlements on the western side of the Appalachian Mountain was long hunting trips, going down into the wilderness in southwest Virginia and eventually across the line into North Carolina colony mm -hmm. territory. His first wife passed away after their 10th child was born. And just a, a couple of years prior to that, he had saved the a life of Catherine Sherrill during an attack at Fort Watauga. Uh -huh. uh, in 1776 they were at Fort Watauga and she was caught outside the gate mm -hmm. when the Cherokee attacked and as she was running down along the wall of the fort to avoid being captured he saw her, but his rifle was empty because he'd been shooting at the warriors attacking. Uh -huh. So he set his rifle aside and he withdrew his pistol and he leaned over the wall as far as he could and dropped her closest pursuer. Then he threw his pistol into the yard inside the fort and he grabbed her hands and lifted her over the top of the wall and got her inside the fort where she was safe. And so after his first wife passed away, he and Catherine got reacquainted. Everyone was calling her Bonnie Kate. Bonnie Kate, I've heard that name. And Bonnie Kate became his second wife. Mm -hmm. uh, they were married and had eight children, to, eight more children. And right while they were celebrating the wedding was when he got a, a, saw the letter from Patrick Ferguson threatening to bring the British Army in hang all the leaders in the settlements and destroy the settlements by fire and sword. Mm -hmm. And so they sent word out to all the men to meet at Sycamore Shoals in September. And in that month, in 1780, every man in the settlement showed up. So they would have no one left to defend from Cherokee raids. So they left every third man behind and the rest of them marched over to Kings Mountain where they wound up not only stopping Ferguson, but they killed him in the battle and destroyed one-fourth of the army under Cornwallis. Prior to that, the uh, Patriots in the South had been losing every battle. And after Kings Mountain, the Patriots won every major battle until Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown. He had been active earlier. He had actually uh, worked as a scout some mm -hmm. during the French and Indian War. 
So he had military experience. He was a natural military leader. He was chosen as a militia leader by the people in the Watauga settlements. And he won 35 major <coughs> battles commanding troops. His last battle was the Battle of Hightower in North Georgia while Tennessee was the Southwest Territory uh, following the massacre of the family at Cabot Station. They pursued the uh, force of Creeks, Cherokees, and other Indians and defeated them at the Battle of Hightower. And that was his 35th major battle. He's the only Revolutionary War leader who never lost a major battle. Mm -hmm. 18, by 1776, he and his family had relocated to a place along the Nullichucky River called Mount Pleasant. He was very popular with the men as a military leader, and they nicknamed him Nullichucky Jack. Mm -hmm. And that remained his nickname for the remainder of his life. Duel. Uh, he was serving in the federal legislature when the war started in 1812. He expected that he would be called upon to lead troops, and instead they called upon Jackson. But Jackson's uh, wins in battle at uh, Horseshoe Bend and again later in New Orleans, uh, at that point, uh, just before he died, Severe did begrudgingly admit that he had to give respect to Jackson for military prowess. Uh, this is a American long rifle and there's a great deal of debate about whether it was more common for people in the militia, as John Severe was a militia leader, whether it was more common for people to use a musket or a rifle. A musket was a smooth bore. Uh, its range was only out to about 50 yards, maybe 75, and but it would be loaded and fired quickly, whereas a rifle had a range out to 300 yards, but it took much longer to load. Mm -hmm. Most people could only afford one gun. And when you lived in the frontier, you had to live off the land. And as a result, a rifle would have been far more practical for the people on the frontier than a musket. Now, whichever gun you had, that's what you fought with. And there was no doubt there was a mixture of muskets and rifles used in the militia. But in all likelihood, if someone had brought a musket, they had probably served in the militia back east and they simply brought their musket with them. Whereas if you were moving out here to live, you would have preferred to have a rifle because you didn't know that you were going to have to fight every day but you mm. did know that you were going to have to eat every day <laughs> and so the rifle was a far more practical tool that you could then also use for self-defense so for hunting and fighting. for hunting uh, and fighting there you yes go. and this specific gun once more this i assume is a replica this yeah this okay. is a replica of the pennsylvania style of the american long rifle the american long rifle okay uh, he, he lived life for pleasure just like everyone else. One of the things that people might find interesting was that he did operate a steel on his property, but many people did simply because during the colonial period, the British would not allow very much currency to be used. They didn't want us to have much gold or silver wealth and we had to substitute other things for currency. And one of the things that we substituted was distilled spirits. Mm -hmm. And so if you distilled spirits, that had a set value, you could walk into any store and use it to purchase goods. Mm -hmm. And so if you distilled your own, it was a bit like being able to print your own money. <laughs> oh my. Well, when I heard uh, Made is Moonshine, I thought of the Scotch-Irish. What is his... Uh... Ancestry. Yes. French, Huguenot. French. French Huguenot. Those were the uh, Protestants mm -hmm. in France during uh, uh, the early period. And the King of France rescinded an edict mm -hmm. that prohibited the Catholic from discriminating against the Huguenots. And when that happened, things for the Huguenots gradually became worse as the, as the Catholics started discriminating against them. So his grandfather uh, left England 
for religious freedom because they were more tolerant of Protestants. And he married a Smith a lady named Smith in England. And then uh, John Sevier's father immigrated from England to Baltimore, where he met John Sevier's mother, Joanna Goad. And they uh, were married in, in the Shenandoah Valley when uh, Sevier was born. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some highlights uh, in his career. And one of the primary ones would be something associated with this area, and that's the creation of the state of Franklin, right? Right. There was an effort. It, it, we wanted to be a state. The people in the Watauga settlements wanted to be a state. And so they were going to create a state out of the Appalachian Mountains. And the idea was that the state would be supported by Ben Franklin if they named it the state of Franklin. Mm. And there was correspondence back and forth between Franklin and Sevier, but they would have known each other because Sevier had served in the legislature in Philadelphia uh, during the Revolutionary War period. And so there was some correspondence back and forth, but Congress never got behind it and it didn't quite take off. Uh, it did lead to some difficulties for Sevier because he had been chosen to be the governor of the state of Franklin and he did his best to make that work, but it never became recognized as a state. And the North Carolina rescinded the offer and had him arrested. Mm for uh, sedition against the state. He was taken to, uh, oh, I can't think of the name of the town, Morganton, he was taken to Morganton. North Carolina. And yes, North Carolina across the mountain and left with the jailer there. But as it turned out, the jailer had stood shoulder to shoulder with Sevier at Kings Mountain, <laughs> fighting against the British there. Uh, and comrade. so as soon as the men who arrested him rode away, the jailer sent him, sent him back across the mountain uh, he stopped at a tavern and was having drinks with one of the other leaders at Kings Mountain when his son and some men from the settlements found him. They brought a horse and he returned back to the settlement. And then the governor lost the following election and because he and Sevier were political rivals. And the fellow that won the election was a supporter of Sevier and so Sevier took the oath of allegiance to the state of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And then in 1790, it became the Southwest Territory. Congress accepted the land. And when Tennessee became a state in 1796, only one third of it was settled. It was a, a wilderness state and two thirds of the state was still Indian land. We hope you've enjoyed Bob Jones and his descriptions of why John Sevier is Tennessee's first and most famous hero. Here in the Maples History Center, from time to time on our YouTube page, we'll show you glimpses of other Sevier County notables through the years. If you'd like to make a suggestion or recommendation of a person who helped make our county what it is today, then give us a call or drop us an email. Or visit us on the third floor of the King Family Library. We have tons of books, not only on our county, but other counties throughout the state, as well as other states as well. We even have a full collection devoted to the Appalachians. Hope to see you here soon, or at least at next year's celebration of Sevier County Day.